I think I might look unnecessarily critical in that thumbnail photo, but honestly, I only have until my rice is finished cooking to film this, so it's, it's fine. Rosie here. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I am coming at you with a single book review. I don't remember the last time I made one of these. Probably not that long ago. My memory is not great these days. But it's felt like a while and this is the perfect book to jump back in. I very recently read Winifred Watson's Miss Pettigrew Lives by it. Miss Pettigrew Lives for a day. <laughs> This was published in 1938 originally and is now republished by Persephone Books. I won this wonderful copy, which I forgot to bring downstairs with me when I went to grab my laptop. Last year, when I was one of the bingo completers for March of the Moderns, this year, Margaret Pernard is hosting May of the Moderns. I am definitely not going to be a bingo completer because this is the only book I managed to read, but I'm so glad that it's the one I picked. I haven't had loads of headspace for like complicated reading or anything that demands too much thinking lately, and this was the perfect balance of entertaining and fun with also dipping my toes back into really thinking about things again. Hence the need for a single book review, which I don't do very often. Should I do more of them? Let me know in the comments. All right, where to start? I haven't even told you what this book is about. Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day is about Miss Pettigrew, who is in her middle age. I think she's supposed to be 40-ish, in her 30s, 40s, something like that. And she's a gentlewoman. Right? She was born to a certain class of society, but penniless. So she now works as a governess and has spent her entire adult life, I think, pretty much living in other people's homes, raising other people's bratty children, being mistreated by everybody, um, you know, feeling really quite hard done by and actually quite hard done by wage-wise, I think, but still with this sense of what one does. One day she's looking for a new job, she's really down on her luck, and the employment agency sends her to an address where the other main character, whose name I forgot to take note of, so I've now forgotten, opens the door and she is swept up into a completely different life. Instead of being sent to another house to be a governess to another set of children, she's accidentally been sent to, I think, an American nightclub singer, although there was nothing to me that ever said she was American, so I'm not too sure about that. I might be making that detail up. She just gets entirely swept up in this glamorous life of a 20-something-year-old nightclub singer who's got like multiple lovers and all the clothes and all the parties and through a sequence of events which I will let you discover Miss Pettigrew is just sucked into this new world and like has sort of a dizzying day of experiencing everything as the title would suggest lives for a day it only takes place over the span of one day okay this was so interesting my first note here is that if you think of the Franny Fisher novels that I am endlessly in love with, go check out my video about those if you haven't heard me talk about them already. This book feels like what Franny Fisher is reimagining. This book feels like it is taking the type of setting and the type of circumstance that Carrie Greenwood is giving a feminist, updated, exciting twist in the Franny Fisher novels. Yes, this place takes place 10 years after Franny, but like very much the vibe is if Buffy is a reimagining of the blonde who gets killed in a horror movie, then Franny is a reimagining of the glamorous nightclub singer in this book. I don't know if Carrie Greenwood has read this book, I feel like she might have, it seems like the sort of thing that she might have read, but either way, that is very much what it is reminiscent of for me. But don't get the impression that this is a mystery or that this is going to be like Franny. It's more reading this, you can see what Franny was adapted from. 
Oh, and the other interesting point is that instead of being from the perspective of the glamorous and like high living wealthy character, it's from the point of view of Dot, if you've read the Franny Fisher novels or seen the show. It's from the point of view of the ordinary down on their luck person seeing into this world, which is kind of interesting as a reader because that's very much how I approach this, right? When you read about these fabulous settings, it's so outside of the day-to-day -day of the ordinary of what most people have experienced. So it's kind of cool to read a novel that's framed that way and that's framed with all of that excitement of like what is even going on here and all of the feelings that that brings. That it was really, really cool to see this perspective of what happened to the sort of women who did the right thing. Um, I don't know. I feel like this had to be on Watson's mind when she was writing it because it's set at the same time when it was written. So Miss Pettigrew would have been born around the year 1900, I think, based on when this book is taking place and how old she is, which means she would have been a young woman right after the First World War, when famously, all of a sudden, in Britain, there was a bit of an issue of... Editing Rosie here, I just stopped talking halfway through that thought for some reason, so let me finish it here. What I was trying to say is that at the end of the First World War, I have heard mentioned in other books that there was a bit of a situation where there were more young women at a point in their lives where they were expecting to get married and hoping to get married than there were young men of that generation because of the extent of the losses suffered in the First World War. So you have these women who are ready to get married, but like just numbers wise, there was a chunk of women who there was not any young men to marry. Oh, right. Um, I assume this was the thing in other countries as well. It's just I've only read about it before from a British context. That's a whole other scope of things I need to learn more about. Leave recommendations down below if you have them. Anyway, so we've got this woman who didn't have a chance to marry, who didn't have a chance to meet someone who she could build that life with and did everything right. You know, she did all the things that she was supposed to do, but she didn't get what society sort of implicitly promised. And then to have her look at the lives of people who are doing everything wrong, who are doing all of the things that society says is immoral or sinful or whatever. And, but they're happy, they're having fun. They're like, what did I get out of all of this is basically a quote from the book that I've said I should talk about. But again, I forgot it upstairs, so I can't. I mentioned that seeing this world through the eyes of an ordinary person was really cool as a reader. And it's very true because you get such vivid descriptions of the atmosphere and the setting and the clothes. Everything is so richly and beautifully described. If you don't like descriptive books, this might not be your vibe. I don't know, read a sample. I personally love it when books are descriptive about things I find interesting, which like vintage fashions and vintage interior decor, vintage social manners, vintage... I just, that, that's a topic I find so cool to learn about. And it's really cool to read about it in a book that was written for a contemporary audience where it is so vividly described. I feel like I mentioned another book lately that felt like it could be historical fiction in how vividly the atmosphere was described, but it was contemporary. I think it was Miss Palfrey at the Claremont. That was also fantastic. I will link a review with a wrap up of that up there. This had a sort of similar vibe. This had the level of detail and just reveling in the setting that I really enjoy in a lot of historical fiction. And yet it was written, like I said, as a contemporary. I just, something about that is so cool to me. My next topic of discussion is also something that really originally came to mind when I was thinking about this book as it could be related to Franny Fisher and the novels about her. And I'm going to start by reading a note and hopefully that'll get me off on a good start. 
If Franny embodies female heterosexual sexuality for its own pleasure's sake, then this book embodies female heterosexual sexuali sexuality for the hold that it has on women where it is their only sense of power in the world. This is just a fascinating kaleidoscope of a number of different women and the way they interact with the world and each other and the men around them in this setting where we very much have the feeling that the only way a woman can gain power or hold in society is through her body and her sexuality in some way. I thought that this was a fascinating portrayal of female sexuality in a patriarchal world where women did not have equal power, even if they had power in other ways. Because we really actually see a lot of this from the wealthier or glamorous women in the story. They have all of these positions and holds in the world, but so much of it depends on their relationship with the men around them. So, Men the glamorous modern women are in relationships with simultaneously inspire strong emotions of love and desire while also causing them distress and being sources of frustration in their lives. So yeah, there's this very interesting duality of they really love them. They have these feelings and emotions and passions and like even some of it is, in my view, pretty clearly supposed to be sexual in nature as well as emotional in nature while also having so many struggles and frustrations and all of the problems in their lives seem to be bound up in these men as well. Yeah, really cool. I, I should have prepared better for this video, but I didn't. So uh, here we are, 13 minutes in. Oops, I meant to be quick. Let me finish this. Okay, I already talked about this. The, okay, no, not so much. The glamour and like, panache of fashion and all of that that Franny Fisher embodies so much is very much present in this book as well. There is a phenomenal makeover scene that, again, I love the descriptive stuff, so you know it's descriptive and long, but I think it also really, really beautifully illustrates the amazing power that clothes can have on our sense of self. I've been really on a journey lately of figuring out what makes me feel good. What do I feel like my best, happiest version of myself when I'm wearing? Should I figure this out by this point in my life? I don't know, probably, but I'm doing it now and it's going quite well, thank you very much. But I think because I've been thinking about that, I've been thinking about how the right thing for us can really have a positive impact. And I'm not saying that in a, oh, if you wear, you know, the most fashionable or like whatever clothes, but when you find the thing that makes you feel good in yourself, that does really have an impact on how your head feels. And we see that so clearly in this novel. It is stunning. We see how an improved sense of self and like feeling good and feeling like, wow, I feel all of the things like confident, I feel glamorous. All of a sudden, Miss Pettigrew actually does sort of not change as a person, but blossom as a person. And I just really, really enjoyed it, okay? There is, I will say, some language of the sexist, racist, anti-Semitic, all of that sort of stuff language that was not great. It's not a huge overtone of the book, but also it does not make any effort to disguise it. Um, there's not prolonged, but like fairly detailed discussions about why a man who's of Italian descent would be like far too exotic for this British woman to marry and like how good it is that she's only going to marry a British man. Definitely some of the ways that like the male characters that clearly are coded as like, wow, he's such a good guy, talk about the women and how they are going to treat the women and how they do treat the women is just kind of, hey, 
unnecessary, did not enjoy. This is a bit of a hard one to talk about as to how to read it. If you're someone who you can acknowledge the gross sexism, racism, whatever in books and move past it, this could definitely be a absolutely delightful romp of a book, such a sweet story. But if you're not, it still has a lot of interest because there is so much depth here. There is so much to think about in terms of character and society and t specific points in history that I find so incredibly exciting in this that I just, I enjoyed this so much, guys. It was phenomenal. It has now been so long and my rice is probably burning because I got too distracted. Let's wrap this up. Let me know down below. First, what did you read for me of the moderns this year? And second, if you have read Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, please let's chat down below. I want to watch the movie very soon. I haven't got to it yet, but I really, really want to. And I'm so excited to see how that compares because I've heard it's an amazing movie. But for now, let's chat all things bookish. Thank you so much for watching this. If you would like to see more of my videos, make sure you hit subscribe down below. And if you liked this one, make sure you hit the like button.